Okay, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you and a special greetings to my past president, President Mel O'Brien. Once a president, always a president. Oh, you go, Greg. Thank you so much for having me. And of course, I have to welcome um, Professor Dalin Renier Bianake, the immediate Prisa past president, and many other members that we have on, including our speakers. My name is Victor Sibeko. I'm your host and convener this morning. I'll be doing all the technical support and um, guiding here and there. This is a very special session we have, and we regard this as part of Prisa's um, legacy programs born out of a brilliant idea when they say two heads are better than one. It, mm -hmm. It's true, unconditioned there are two heads, okay? So this was an initiative by the immediate past president of, of, of Prisa, Madame Rene Bianeke, together with myself to put together a research colloquium to be held on an annual basis. Now, this is the, this is the fourth, Madame Press, yeah? Serious. Okay. The third. No, this is the third. Uh, this is the th no, it is the fourth. It is the fourth. Yeah? Yes, it's the fourth one. This is the fourth one we're having. And we're delighted to have amongst us um, um, you know, members from the academia coming to share with us the best practices and the findings and uh, as to what is happening in the space we live in. And we also take pride in the fact that part of our PRISA members the likes of uh, Madame, Faith, uh, um, Madame Tuelo in Botswana, who was once the president, the, the chairperson of Pisa chapter in Botswana, who is coming, coming in as well to weigh in on the findings of the research. So it, it, it means that it pays to be a member of a professional body and it pays to do something great. Mine is simple this morning, is to just to welcome you and also lay the ground rules. The ground rules are very straightforward, um, uh, maybe preaching, uh, I'm ready to preach to the converted. And the brand rules are that we are on a webinar and please let's keep our, our, our mics muted. And if you'd like to um, say something, you can raise your hand using one of the buttons. And when you ask a question, please do tell us who you are and briefly ask a question. So we will welcome comments. We will welcome compliments as we go along. And we will also, you can also throw in your comments on the chat. And um, if you if you don't, you don't want to speak out, I would like to hand over this brilliant baby um, to Madame President Dalin Reneke Bieneke to take us through um, the research colloquium, the importance why we're doing this, and then we'll then take on to welcome our speakers on our lineup today. The very President Professor Daniel Rene Bieneke will also weigh in on the discussions. Then we have the pleasure of um, having Professor Rolin Brink from the Department of Applied Information Systems, College of Business and Economics will also be part of the discussion and uh, the very first discussion that will be taken up. Then we will also be joined, we'll also have Ms. Siriane Murapedi, a lecturer, the Department of Strategic Communication. Then we have a fellow special colleague and a member of PRISA, uh, Madame Rachine Leroux, who will be talking to us about something very interesting, the internal climate changes uh, companies face in the wake of a new world of work. COVID has changed how we do things, have changed the world of work. What are the findings? What is it that we, we, must, be, we must look out for? And then uh, we would be there later also be graced by a paper uh, from Faith uh, Rapuleng Tuelo, the manager for marketing communication, Botswana Human Resources Development Council, who will also be sharing with us how, how, how technology has enhanced and can change the way we do things. Her findings on digital marketing on promotion of the Joanna Human Resources Development Council. Madam President, um, over to you. Um, good morning, everyone. It seems as if some of our colleagues are having uh, challenges in, um, in uh, connecting. Um, Victor, if you can please just forward the message again to Siri and to Rulin, please. Um, perhaps via email, uh, because both of them are struggling to, to connect. Good morning, everyone. As Vic is saying, um, this is really a proud moment for us at Brisa to share with you our latest um, ideas around research, um, current research. And as an academic, it obviously always 
intrigues me to, um, to share with other like-minded people our research um, findings for the years and some highlights. And I just want to stress that this is not um, the only um, uh, you know, event or only research that's being done. There's obviously a whole lot of other um, research that we don't always have um, access to because we we started this in 2018. And sorry, Mol, can I just ask that you mute on your side? Sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. That's 100%. Um, we started in, in 2018 with the research colloquium idea, and it was um, born out of uh, interest that we I shared with um, the late Prof. Sonia Fave around sharing some of the exciting local scholarly, scholarly my tongue is not with me to this morning, um, scholarly um, findings and, and work that we've had um, the pleasure of, of hearing about on various platforms. Now, as the chair of the um, Committee for Education Research, Research and training at Presa, it's really my honor to, to um, have these, uh, you know, interesting findings, interesting research, and the stuff that we are proud of, um, you know, to, to um, present that annually to you. So the objective um, is really to uh, also make us proud of the work that our, our South African and Southern African members and um, scholar, uh, scholars and um, researchers are actually doing and are involved with on an annual basis. As you would know, many of these um, research projects takes a while to complete, um, and therefore it is important to, uh, you know, give record of, of and report to our members on a regular basis of what are all the um, interesting projects. So how we do it is um, we obviously network with um, a number of um, industries, um, professional bodies, both locally and internationally, to also look then at what are the current focus areas of the various individuals, either sponsored by NRF doing research on specific themes that are of importance to our members. What we then do, and very often we do get requests from our individual researchers, um, also to, to obviously use our and circulate the various um, data collection methodologies, such as the research questionnaire or the surveys, um, with our, you know, amongst our members. So what we then do is obviously they need to give us um, the, the background, the proposal to the, in, uh, to the study. Um, we then look at the, the ethical compo uh, component to it, um, then ask our members because we then coordinate the actual distribution of those lists. So it is really not, um, you know, left to um, us abusing the membership base to just send out uh, research surveys and so forth. I see that there's a number of interesting surveys also um, taking place from the office at the moment, asking members to um, report on what type of research or what, what sorry, what type of, of training needs they have at the moment. So research is really for us a, a very important component. So with that, since 2018, we've had interesting um, projects, um, starting from um, a study that was done by a doctoral study that was done by um, Dr. Tertia Lansbach um, around measurement and um, evaluation. And just by to, to punt that um, event as well, on Friday, we have a webinar um, arranged by AMEC and um, Onico, where you are most welcome to join us as well on discussing measurement and evaluation, especially as it is um, uh, based on Barcelona principles, but also the Barcelona principles of uh, 3.0 that was recently uh, adopted. So um, that's the type of, of um, engagements that we have for our members. Together with that, there was also a presentation um, and a paper delivered by Prof. Um, Martin Gledler from um, Norway on research that he's done in the public sphere. 
um, and then specifically PR in public sphere. Kerry, our, our good friend from um, um, Ipras, she uh, joined us for a paper that they did on ethics and for IR, which was amazing. Prof. Anne Gregory, of course, joined us for um, the uh, capability framework when we first introduced it. And then there was, of course, our local partners um, last year specifically that was it now the previous year? I don't know. With COVID, we all have this gap in our in our number of years. But uh, Brand South Africa also then presented um, latest stakeholder um, measurements or, or um, segmentation to us as uh, and research that they've done. So that's just in brief um, an introduction and a background to what it is that we are, in, you know, finding. Uh, or the reason why we are doing the research colloquium is obviously for our members to benefit and their own decision making to um, develop other interests and share ideas around research um, uh, needs that we may have, uh, projects that we can get involved with, etc. So that was exactly the plan for today um, in terms of presenting to you uh, four projects um, that we were involved with um, through our members this year. And as Victor has mentioned, there's quite a diverse range of, of topics that we're going to, to deal with today. So Victor, if you don't mind putting up my first, um, the capability framework uh, slides, I will appreciate. If you can share that with for us. Um, just also then as in, in light of um, my, my introduction and then of sharing with you our um, ideas around research findings and so forth, just as a, as a brief introduction while um, Victor uh, works on the, on the slides. I don't have host powers, Victor. There we go. Thank you. Can we just slide slide mode for us, please? Can you change it to slideshow? Thank you. That's it. Um, it seems like our friend. Uh, Prof Brink is having problems with Zoom this morning, but nonetheless, let us continue. So in light of my um, previous comments around the reason why and, and some of the research projects, such a, a project was um, the uh, Global Alliance that we um, uh, partnered with and then specifically with Prof um, Anne Gregory. And we looked at, um, for just a brief, brief background, because time is obviously of the essence, um, just a brief background to the Global Alliance's uh, project um, around capability framework. The uh, project was started in 2016 and they published in 2018 the um, research that they've done around the a new capability framework for public relations um, you know, globally. So Prof. Anne Gregory and Prof. Um, Johanna Falks um, uh, did the research and they then published the um, capability framework. Now, obviously we are always interested in finding the relevance of such a framework within our own context within South Africa. So that's when five of my colleagues, um, research colleagues, and that's specifically um, uh, Deirdre uh, uh, Putin from CPUT, Cape Peninsula University of Technology, um, uh, uh, Nielke Duplessis from uh, Pretoria University, uh, doc, um, hopefully soon to be Dr. Helena van Veik from uh, Monash, and um, a, a colleague of mine, Clarissa Muir here from UJ and then myself. We were a research team, formed a research team specifically looking at um, the suitability, um, the interest, the um, relevance of the capability framework within the South African um, context. 
So we started with a pilot study. You can move to the next slide. Thanks, Victor. Next slide, please, Victor. Um, the, while Victor is, is putting up the, the next slide or moving to the next slide, um, we, the, the project started um, really to look at um, specifically in the pilot phase, how the academics are um, finding the, the role of, of uh, the capability framework relevant to the curriculum. But then also we looked at the interest and the uh, um, uh, availability of people like um, uh, our industry leaders. And we specifically, and that's where Prisa came in. We specifically looked at the interest of the, and the views of our senior um, APR leaders in, um, in South Africa and then in what exactly they feel and how they see the, the capability framework. Now, there are just um, a few points of, uh, you know, uh, as an introduction, uh, but then also to um, look at what the, what the key um, approaches were that we followed. So um, our team of five um, embarked really on as quickly as possible on uh, doing the, the necessary ethical clearance, which was quite a, a steep um, uh, you know, process at all the different institutions, um, which is always, and you can rest assured that it was approved by all the um, academic institutions as being an ethical and well-rounded study. So we started off with um, asking uh, pertinent questions. Remember now the um, capability framework was actually designed pro COVID. So we wanted to find out from our participants, how would that influence um, and how will the relevance of the capability framework um, stay within uh, the South African context post COVID? And what are we looking for? So it was a qualitative study, and we then specifically looked at um, the data and the, uh, the data analysis. We used different uh, forms of uh, data um, analysis, which include the reflexive um, data uh, thematic analysis that we used. So um, the key findings, I don't know what happened to the slides now, but I'm going to continue. Um, I think we, we also um, learned to practice our audio skills uh, during COVID. So some of the key findings that we've had, the next slide, um, Victor, um, was that the, the, the participants felt that the key, um, that the capability framework is actually um, essential um, going forward. And it, the reason why they found it so useful is that it replaced the old competency model. Now competencies deal with what is it that we are currently need, uh, in need of. Um, where the, the question, and you, um, you may not have um, seen my, my quote from um, Professor Fox that I had on the screen. It is um, the, the, the focus with um, the capability framework was to look at what are the industry capable? What are the possibilities? What are the opportunities that we are going to work with and work towards in the future? So uh, one of the key findings then was that people are keen to not only move um, from away from the capability of the competency framework, which was is really the normative framework, but actually looking at the potential, looking at what we are capable of doing. And that was really the focus of our research. So there was um, limited, obviously limited awareness of the framework within South African context. There was a strong recommendation by our um, participants that we need, and that uh, was across the board, both our uh, um, academics and our industry leaders felt that we should have this in our curriculum. 
um, which is a wonderful opportunity for us to also adapt our curriculum then to what, um, uh, what is comp uh, uh, relevant to our students and also then to our future industry practitioners. Um, there needs to be, and this was quite important for us, we needed to have an understanding of strategic thinking. So strategic thinking was, was missing. Another key finding for us was that wellness and um, individual development of a strategic a communication practitioners' attention to their own well-being was lacking, and that needs attention. And then, obviously, as we could imagine, um, you know, uh, technological um, uh, skills or technology skills um, is really one of those things that <laughs> was absolutely came to the fore with um, with COVID. Um, then we uh, identified a number of key issues that needed attention and these issues the next slide please victor the, these issues um, involved in the development of contextual intelligence um, now this is a very interesting um, in you know side comment that we almost picked up from our from our participants is that there's a lack of um, contextual intelligence within our country um, and countries in the Southern Hemisphere as to how uh, not only the capabilities and the possibilities and um, opportunities can be enhanced, but also to understand um, the intricacies, the complexity of our local um, communities, our local communication um, industry, and what we need to do around that. The, um, another issue that needed to, um, and that we identified as a, an important one, was that um, the capability framework also needs to um, develop additional capabilities to deal with the complex disruptive environment. So it is exactly what, why we asked the question of what is the relevance and how suitable is the capability framework for us post COVID. So that was one of the key findings um, and issues that we need to look at for the future. And then capability to deal with organizations as adaptive self-organizing um, social structures that, that has to deal with these emerging crises all the time. Now, as you can see, and, and me being a um, person, a pragmatic person, together with an academic, and that's often not a very um, uh, regular combination, I wanted to know, so how do we do this? So that is the second phase of our research. How do we actually deal with these four, um, and specifically then in 4IR, um, how do we deal with that on our everyday, um, uh, you know, um, challenges and you know the the um, just to punt something that I always find very interesting many people say for, to our students that um, let me show you how the real world works once they enter the um, industry and what people often forget is that there are different realities and different ways of, of or different worlds and we are trying to now navigate these different worlds that we are exposed to, not only academics and academia, but actually building a bridge and many bridges uh, between the two or the different realities, not just the two realities. The next slide, please, um, Victor, which deals then with specifically the findings around, um, thank you, the findings influencing the curricula. Um, there was a, a, a transformational mindset, which is extremely important. And, um, you know, I think, Mo, you will um, like, this, like this sentence, is that uh, if we don't change our mindset and if we don't change our habit of mind, we are going to try until we blew in the face to be competent. Um, unless we change the way that we learn, not just for an end goal, but actually as a process. Um, and that's the transformational uh, mindset that we are going to look for, that we work with the capability framework as a CPD 
uh, opportunity for us, not only for practitioners, but also for the students that they build up almost or accumulate different types of relevant skills for their unique focus areas where they're going to go in the future. So the um, capability framework will have to add another layer or another pillar or to the three pillars. And I on purpose didn't um, bog you with all the different pillars. That's why I have the article that was published subsequent to our research in the Journal of um, uh, Communication Studies. Um, it's a accredited journal and it was published in, in, um, in July. And we also did a paper um, at the BLED, um, annual BLED conference um, in July on this uh, research. So it has been published broadly so that we can actually get to the, the third point on that, uh, on that slide, which is the partnerships. The partnerships in um, learning opportunities, not only for our students, but also for us as practitioners to form networks and share with each other the learning, especially given the complexities and the, the line or the different um, uh, environments that we find ourselves in at the moment. So that is the first presentation, ladies and gentlemen. I see that Victor has um, set aside some questions at the end. I don't know if you want to perhaps post questions now or if you want to keep it there to the end. Victor? I'm just thinking that, um, perhaps now that we've, we've got our time, we're managing our time very well, in order not to allow to get people to lose their thought train, maybe just to allocate uh, five questions or so, allocate time for five questions mm -hmm. or so, comments, mm -hmm. questions on this particular topic, because it's quite a, it's quite a hot one. And um, you're speaking of transformation, you're speaking of partnerships, and you're speaking of relevance, which is something that we need now. And continuous professional development is key for us to stay relevant. Mm -hmm. um, I, I could, we, we could um, open the, the floor for five minutes, questions, comments. I did mention that you can also comment on the um, yes. on, online. Well, I think if I could just jump in here um, to say thank you very much, Renee. I really do welcome um, this opening presentation for today. Um, the contextual intelligence part particularly grabs me as a futurist. So I'm really keen on also seeing how the competencies around foresight and innovation and being able to upskill the for our practitioners to be able to grasp the consequences and impacts um, that are coming out of the sector at this point in time and the power that the sector has to actually change the narrative um, through upskilling and through being able to get a better handle on some of the critical issues that we're facing globally as an industry. Um, and so I think we actually may be well placed, better placed, let's see how the presentations go today, but I certainly do appreciate um, the findings that you presented to us today. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Victor. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Press. Once a president, always a president. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other comment, compliment from the delegates, attendants, colleagues? Mul, can I have a follow up um, question then to you? Yes. Is to um, how would you envisage? us taking this pilot um, project, which was now the first phase of rolling out or, or looking at the relevance. Um, would, how would you see the second phase of this research playing out in our, in our country? What would be your interest in terms of the people, the participants? Who would you want us to, to focus on? You know, I think a really handy tool that could come out um, would be even as an industry is to run a Delphi, um, okay. Renee. I don't know if you've, you've yes. been involved with it, but the Delphi was what we ran at critical points in our country's history. Um, we also then did that globally before we did the brand South Africa research was building, kind of getting a sense of where our consensus 
are around critical issues and where we are competent to enter into trade and who is ready for us to engage and really just getting a handle on that. And I feel we've kind of, um, with all the ground shifting, it'll be really nice to run a Delphi and even that structuring that out um, to kind of gain more foresight on a roadmap ahead for the sector would be then for me a, a kind of as a futurist with what you've presented the logical next step for me would be a Delphi. Beautiful. And I'm happy to contribute, you know, to kind of um, having a round table on how we look at that. That would be beautiful because um, it's actually well positioned because um, Prof. Anne Gregory, um, who was one of the, the um, lead researchers on mm -hmm. the, the capability framework, she, they mm -hmm. actually in their research use Delphi as well. And she has Fantastic. been appointed now as our visiting professor at UJ. So mm -hmm. um, she would be brilliant for us to involve her next year into such a Delphi study. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you very okay. much, Will. We'll um, arrange that round table yeah. when we can have uh, some visuals yeah. and some uh, yeah. non-virtual sessions, actually physical yeah. sessions. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks for that. That's beautiful. You're welcome. You're welcome. Then I see Murumukhola has got a question. Hand up. All right. Um, just, just keep it brief. Uh, Murumukhola, straight to the question. <laughs> thank you, thank, thank you, thank you, Mr. Tishwara. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful introduction and, and, and um, contextualization. When you when you had your slide on uh, changing the mindset, my question is: oh, By the way, colleagues, I'm oh, I'm a member of uh, the academia and I'm also a researcher. What mindset and how do we how, how how are we going to change this mindset? I understand that everything else changes except the law of change. Just how are we going to change the mindset? That, that's my question. Thank you, Prof. That is such a beautiful question, and I'm so glad you have joined us today. I'm really looking still forward to uh, us continuing and starting this new relationship that we've started a, a few weeks ago. Um, it's a brilliant question because, you know, people do not want to necessarily change because we are so comfortable in our own way of doing and thinking and, you know, not moving, shaking the boat and shaking, um, shaking ourselves out of our comfort zone. So I think I really personally think <laughs> and it, it's not always uh, such a nice thing to hear, but sometimes we do need a bit of a, a, a wake up call. And I think COVID has given us that wake up call um, to critically look at how can we do things differently? If you just, and, and it was actually quite interesting, some um, of the participants in our capability research actually said that. They said that um, they were for, for, for the first time ever, not just reminded of the, um, the need for adapt adaptation of, of new technologies and in, including new technologies, new platforms and so forth, but they were actually forced to do um, a mind shift and really forced to use new technologies. And that's when they picked up how bad they are at it. So that's one of the, the key issues is that we sometimes need to be uncomfortable. We need to be um, really confronted that things are not necessarily as beautiful as we, as we think they are. And then to look at a broader, and that's where I am so passionate about, um, finding out different ways of doing things. Um, and that is the research part. And that's where we need the collaborations and others to, um, uh, to find different ways that suit our needs in the Southern Hemisphere to actually answer questions. And that's where I would like to call on everyone here. And we have quite a, a good number of 37 people um, uh, attending today that we all form part of a different way of mindset. Just something that I read, read um, yesterday and I actually made it my uh, status profile um, on, on WhatsApp, my status um, is that we forget 
how influence, influential our thought patterns are to the ones that we are encountering or people that we are working with. So mm -hmm. if we change our own thinking, and that is back to your question, Mulholle, is we need to change our own thinking first. And then, then we need to spread that message to our um, colleagues and our fellow citizens. Um, so the process starts with ourselves. So our own critical thinking, our own way of, of really starting to, to look at new ways. And that mm. there's no single recipe. And that we found with capability research as well. This is mm. a good guideline and we need to work with that. But it's mm. by no means a cast in stone because that does not work. We found mm. that. The research that I'm reading now on COVID and crisis and crisis comms is actually echoing that, saying that we can't be doing this uh, the same old, same old crisis comms recipe, follow these um, ideas and then it will be better. We need to find new ways of dealing with disruptive um, situations. So that was now a long answer to your, your brilliant question, Mohamed. <laughs> Okay, Madam President, shall we shall we hold it right here? Yes. And thank you so much for to to Madam Holu and to Madam President Mel O'Brien. Madam, you you spoke of SEDEC, Southern Africa, and we're delighted that within the the members that are here today, we have uh, quite lucky and um, representation of SEDEC. We've got Zimbabwe, we've got Tanzania, we've got Eswatini, we've got Namibia, Botswana, and Lesotho. So it's looking good, and um, I think. I think this will also be exciting for our partners. You spoke of partnership, Brand South Africa, and uh, let me welcome the relationship manager, Pumeza Ceza, and uh, the marketing manager, Mr. Tepiso Malele. Welcome uh, to the team. We really appreciate your presence. This now takes us to the second topic for today on the, um, the storytelling co collaboration. Um, Madam Press, Seeing that the colleagues have not joined yet, you may have well, to they are. That as well. They have joined. Okay. They are, oh, yes. Right. They are online, okay. they've confirmed. Brilliant. Okay. Mm -hmm. I will then load the next set of slides if you allow me to. Yes. Um, Thank you. I would like to acknowledge my colleagues, Prof. Rulin Brink. Rulin, I see you are present. <laughs> Rulin, can you hear me? Yes, I'm here. Sorry, sorry, Prof. I'm here. Uh -huh. oh, wonderful. I know you struggled to log on, so I'm very I'm glad to see you are here. Yeah, um, the lawyer um, helped me today. <laughs> <laughs> then we also have our most favorite, and I, I know we, we just love him, and that is our lawyer, as, as um, Rulina said, um, Mr. Elton Hart. Those of you that sometimes listen to Afrikaans radio would recognize him. Um, they often get him to speak on legal matters on Aris here. So Elton, I also saw you present. And where's Elton? Elton. Is logging on on his phone because he's between oh, campuses. Okay. Oh. Alton, can you hear us? Is he still on mute? Okay. Okay. Can you guys then, hear me now? Yes, oh yes, we can, we can hear, hear you. you. Good. Thank well you, Victor. Done. Victor, you. I'm I'm sort of half in overalls because our law <laughs> clinic is also turning forty years. So. Wow. It's like. Yeah, the law clinic is 40 years old. So people excuse me for looking like a cap because it's very hot in the sun hanging posters. <laughs> but for me, from my side, um, as um, the partner in law, not the partner in crime, the partner in law, I want to put an <laughs> emphasis on that. Um, it was a wonderful experience. And when um, Prof. Brunk and Prof. Benneke actually came with the idea of us working in a multidisciplinary project, I thought to myself, oh, what is this lady putting me up to again? I don't know. But eventually I found out that I'm actually working with two brilliant minds and they opened up my way of thinking also of how we actually do things. And it was very important because as a lawyer, you need strategic communication skills. And going into the 4IR, which is already upon us, you need computer skills. And by looking at it from that angle, I saw 
this to women is actually very important in my life and in my students' life and what they can actually bring to the table. So for me, that was the important thing. And what I bring to the table is like, you guys would know now, Poppy is one of the prominent um, pieces of legislation that's being thrown at everybody, be it in a phone call, an SMS, wherever you walk in Poppy. And this is where we saw that the law student is legally trained. They can actually bring that experience to the strategic communication students and the applied legal um, applied information system students, what you can put on a website, what should be in communication. And that fusion of the three disciplines is actually the way to go. And for us, the symbiotic relationship between law, Stratcom, and the College of Business and Economics, which is actually now applied information systems, is one for the future. And from my students' perspective, speaking to them, they said, actually, sir, we didn't actually realize that we can actually go and work in an IT company and actually use our skills there. I yeah. did not even realize that I can actually go and work in a digital communications company and then use my IT skill, my legal background with this that I've learned from the strategic communications, how they do things. Then actually it makes me more employable. And that is the thing that's now or at the forefront. Employees wants to see people that's employable. So for me and my students, this actually opened up the frame for employability to increase of my students. And obviously, I, this could not and wouldn't have been possible without our stakeholders. And I'm specifically speaking about our external stakeholders and actually how they drive this process now to actually like the brand they say, and also what is happening today with Prisa. This is also um, exposing our students and through me, they are being exposed to Botswana, to our neighboring countries like Victor has mentioned them. So for me and my students, this is a brilliant opportunity and this is how we need to now look at the future of what we're going to do and how we amalgamate all these disciplines because we can no longer see law as something in a box. And people normally talk about think outside the box. I think we think around the box nowadays. So it's not inside, it's not outside, it's around the box. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. That's how I see it. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Alton. You know, I often say, don't, I don't think out of the box because the opportunity may be lying on the <laughs> other side of the box. I get out of the box, kick the box away, then I think freely. <laughs> Excellent. All right. That's the way to go. Good. Idea. Good. Right. Will Let's, you put up the slides so then we, yes, can, we can go over the slides? Thank you. Yeah, let's and do then this. Of, thank you. There and then, go. of course, we have um, also Siri Siriani, my colleague, who um, was the actual hands on um, hands on and feet on the ground person with um, with the students and that interface with the students. So um, you we just you had quite an interesting introduction from from Elton there as to his involvement and where this project started but the next slide will give you a little bit more of an understanding why we are we included this as a collaborative interdisciplinary interfaculty um, project involving and Elton you you were um, uh, absolutely 100% correct in terms of what we have um, and why we have this project. The next slide will show you um, that we had a specific problem statement that we that we looked at. And this is where the research part comes in because in academia, unless you link it to um, research, it is a very difficult thing to get funding for projects. So um, apart from the, the, the um, you know, collaborations that we've had, we also had the need, and those of you that are, have been in our industry for many years would know that in um, strategic communication and in public relations, our young people and our, we often get that feedback that people do not know how to write. And even more so, they don't know how to represent others. Um, they think it's a, it's a tick box exercise. They put up a, a, a social media calendar or social media page and they do a few events and then they've done communication. 
we, um, we know that is not true. And then also the level of communication is, um, is not always uh, effective. So we needed to develop skills um, for our students within our students' capabilities of them becoming storytellers, but also then a change agents within their local communities. Now, just as a quick background, um, you can imagine, and I know you've seen many newspaper um, and, and media articles and reports on how difficult learning is on a remote and on an online space. And especially so, and this is where um, Ruline and I and, and Elton had, um, had really to scratch our heads as I am doing literally, um, we, we had to find ways of involving our students while they are off campus. It's much easier when they're on campus, but if they are completely um, uh, decentralized or, or spread across the country, how do you involve them in actually building um, work integrated learning skills? How do they uh, learn experientially um, without having a combined, um, more than just an academic uh, theoretical project where they, or content that they have to deal with online, but actually build their, their engagement skills, their uh, personal response, uh, relationship um, building skills, their storytelling, all of those came into being. And then that's where we partnered now with uh, Brand South Africa and specifically their stories of hope, because I also know that you are with me in the sense of understanding the need to have and provide communities with hope. So we had then senior students in, in all the different departments, our um, senior third year um, applied information systems, which um, Rulin will talk about just now. Uh, we had them, we had senior um, fourth year students, third and fourth year law students, and then our second and third year um, strategic communication PR students, all working together in groups to do then the, re, um, the different stories. So that was our problem statement that we dealt with. Now I'm going to hand over um, to, to Rulin to speak to the aims and objectives, if you don't mind, Rulin. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Renai. So the aims, of the, object, uh, the aims and objectives of this project, maybe, uh, Victor, if you can go to the next slide. So the aims of the uh, and objectives of, of this project was last year, uh, Renee and Elton and myself, um, we, we come together and we decided that we need to now really think out of the box for work integrated education and how to prepare our students and make our students more employable for the marketplace. And um, we realized that uh, we can do uh, innovation, we call it an uh, innovation project for, for the university. So the five aims that we identify was, first of all, to empower the students to store and write stories and demonstrate, uh, demonstrating uh, hope and playing our parts. So this was nicely linked to the theme of the brand South Africa. So the second one was also to create a digital platform to showcase UJ's work integrated education. So this means that all the work integrated education from the law side, the strategic communication, as well as the AIS will be showcased on a digital platform. Then the third one was to create a digital platform for users to share their stories of hope. So the AIS students, together with the strategic communication and the law students work hand in hand with this specifically uh, because you will see that uh, the objective of number four is to fully compliant with the POPIA and to avoid copyright and infringements. It is very important if you develop or you tell a story, if you develop a website, it's very important to know what you can and cannot upload on a website. 
And it's also important for the students from the strategic communication to know what can they include as part of these stories and how they can tell these stories. And the last one is to also give the young people and ordinary community members hope and a platform to voice their experiences. So let's let's go over to the descriptions of, of the project. So if we can go to the next slide. So the project descriptions was, it is, a, like I said, a multidisciplinary interfaculty project that was divided into two phases. So the reason why it was divided into space into phases is for, for better management and to scaffold the learning of, of the students. Uh, the projects uh, involved, it was 260 strategic communication students. So it was first year and third year strategic communication students. And then the AIS students was one group of eight students developing the digital platforms. Uh, the law students was uh, 40 students from law, but the law students um, support the strategic communication, but I also have one law student allocated to applied information systems to help the uh, students from an IT perspective of what to include and not to include from a POPIA uh, point of view on the website. The AIS students then were also tasked to provide various digital platforms for the students to showcase these stories. And the second phase involves interviewing local influencers uh, who will be interviewed and uploaded to the main UJ Spotify account. And I was present when we, we've uh, done one of those uh, videos and it was amazing. Uh, you can actually see how the students grow from the beginning of the year to that, that second phase. All the faculties involved, so the faculty of, of humanities, the faculty of law and applied information systems fall under the faculty, uh, the College of Business and Economics. We will have one web page for each faculty showcasing the wonderful work of work integrated learning. Just something that I need to add here is that this group worked together with one of my other groups and the entire project day for AIS was running on this virtual platform. So, I mean, all the projects, all 14 projects was running through their website. Uh, Sherry, if I can hand over to you. And then Victor, if you can show us the next slide, thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Good day, everybody. Um, I was, well, I'm in the same department as um, Prof. Bianeke, and um, I was working uh, closely with the students, especially in the first phase and in the second phase of the project. Okay, so uh, my colleagues have given extensive background on it, so I will just be touching on it um, here and there. So before I get started, I wanted to um, briefly touch on the importance of storytelling in our Department of Strategic Communication in terms of our teaching and learning. So um, we as a department pride ourselves in how proud our students are of their South African and African heritage. And um, we uh, see our students or involve our students in projects where they go into communities and identify um, real life problems in the communities and um, work to create or um, devise uh, strategic communication solutions to those problems. And this is evident through the many projects that our students are involved in that they um, use to enter awards. And um, over the years and of recent, we've had quite a few students um, enter awards and win their awards. So um, one of the students being um, Ms. Payal, um, who's um, in the slide uh, shown here, um, Ms. Payal Maharaj. So uh, mm -hmm. she uh, developed um, a project that based on the United Nations 2030 Sustainable Goals on Mental Health. So she identified that there's um, 
serious mental health issues in our communities. And um, there's a need to tell these stories because of the stigma around it and people suffering in silence. So she created platforms, um, a platform on Instagram whereby people can tell those stories. So um, uh, uh, holding on to that idea and um, uh, storytelling as an important uh, a way of telling our stories and influencing people's behaviors. Uh, this is why do we um, continued on with the storytelling project. Um, Victor, if you can kindly move to the next slide. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Prof. Rulin uh, explained um, the details around the storytelling project. So I'm not going to hop on about that again. But what I want to emphasize is that at the core of our of the storytelling project was um, social issues. So Brand South Africa um, is a big advocate of showing South Africa in a positive light and touching on these um, issues and telling stories around it that we can, there's hope of South Africa. There's a different way of looking at South Africa despite these social issues. So again, we encourage our students to identify social issues within the community that they are in um, and in their personal lives, social issues that are personal to their lives and um, try to find, um, tell a story around those issues, tell stories of hope around those issues. Mm -hmm. So what we uncovered was um, most of the students identified um, poverty and mm -hmm. violence, any kind of violence, gender-based, um, child abuse, uh, sexual violence as one of the most prominent mm -hmm issues, social issues in our country. And um, they worked to identify community influencers who are addressing these issues in their communities. Um, so what was amazing about this is that uh, the community influencers that were identified by our students were everyday people. We're not people where they're not celebrities, they're not well-known people um, uh, online or um, in whatever social circles that we, where we would normally think, okay, hope for people to be known. But the everyday people that identify the issue in their surroundings and are working every day to try to solve the issue. Um, I think that's what made it more personal. And that's what um, uh, created the most impact in not only the students' lives, the students that were actually going out to gather all this information, research and try to showcase the information on the various platforms. Um, but also on us as we were going through the work. And I believe people that saw the, 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 the showcasing of the work. And the success rates were, uh, of course, 70% of our students did very well for the assessments. And um, what was also great is that there were sustained projects from um, the storytelling project. So if you can move on to the next slide, please, Victor. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, as I said, one of the, the great things is that our students sustained some of the projects. So they went on to establish their own nonprofit organizations based on um, these storytelling projects. So one of our students um, developed a nonprofit where she sells sanitary pads because of um, uh, the problem that she saw in her community with poverty and women not having access to personal hygiene products and of feminine hygiene products. And um, uh, when you buy these particular project um, products, some of the, the proceeds go to uh, a nonprofits, other charities and organizations in her community. So um, basically uh, what I can say to sum it up in for my reflection and the reflections of the students is that hope helps us move forward with COVID and everybody experiencing fears and worries about tomorrow, this storytelling project um, reignited hope in us that there's still hope and that there's a need to tell these stories to encourage people to move on, to pick up and see the light and do their best in um, um, any aspect of their lives because it is recognized. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to Elton. Mr. Elton. Alton, are you there? Good. The next slide, please, Vic. Uh, 
Elton, can you? Okay. I'm not sure if Elton is audible. Um, okay, shall I continue then? Um, I'm not sure what happened to Elton. Perhaps he's putting up another poster. Um, but the review of the projects, um, just mm. then briefly. Are you there, Elton? Rene? Yes. Can you can continue? You, can you hear me? Yes, we can. So I'm trying to figure out because I know that you asked something, but I couldn't hear clearly. Oh, okay. Are you going to do the last two slides? Can you see them or shall I continue? Because I can barely see them because I'm following on my phone. That's fine. So it's I will, a little bit difficult. That's fine. I will conclude our presentation. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, you, you heard what um, um, Elton and Siri and Ruli now um, gave uh, or reflected on with the different involvement uh, and, and parts that they played in this amazing project. But, um, uh, you know, to me, you can see the, the results there. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on, on that um, any longer because I know our time is a little bit of the essence. But I can just say from our side is that um, a very um, unique, very challenging project. Um, I think, Siri, you really experienced that challenge firsthand to work through the different um, uh, stories uh, because what we didn't um, necessarily get time to share with you. But, you know, we scaffolded the students first working in groups um, to see what type of ideas they come up with, such as what Siri shared but then also um, having them to tell their own individual stories. Now, um, you know, Elton, um, when we, we looked as a, as a team through the projects and through the stories, Elton had one specific story that really grabbed him and that he wanted us to form, but we couldn't get the, the permission from the individual. But that was such an um, amazing story of somebody turning their life around in a local community, having been involved with um, crime, and that's why it spoke to to Elton and his, um, you know, his, his industry and his um, interest. Um, and how that is possible. And I think um, somebody said the other day to a media house, why don't you give more a balanced uh, view of 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 our society, of what's happening in society. And I think that's the that's what we really try to do with this um, with this project. And it really, you can move to the last slide. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, was there a hand up or comment? Um, yeah. A minute, Muhal put it 30 seconds. OK. Yeah. Sorry, there's an open mic. I thought that somebody had a question. <laughs> you all please mute your mic. You um, the, you know, I would really like to end off with just acknowledging the different departments and um, specifically in the Presa, and that's why we're presenting the research and the project um, as uh, to you today is um, you know, the role of, of partners such as Prisa and Brand South Africa is essential in projects like this. We as internal audience or internal group, um, our different faculties and our different staff members that's willing to do, it's what we said earlier on, change our own mindsets and try something different and try to meet our students where they are. Um, it's not possible without collaboration and, and, and um, having partnerships. So our students were absolute stars. They loved it. Um, at very short notice, I got the group that showcased um, a, a small business in a local community, um, a young man who started his own t-shirt company. And um, the student, I literally phoned the students, I think it was on the Wednesday, to say, um, ask them if they're available on the Friday so that we can um, shoot the, the, the content and have the um, service provider in. And it happened, it just happened. 
Um, that's why Raleen was there because I couldn't be there and neither could Elton and neither could Siri. So it was just amazing in my own reflection of how um, collaborations between faculties, between interested parties and like-minded people can actually benefit um, a society, a group of people that we didn't know before. Um, and that's the type of, of research that I want and, and projects that I want us to to really uh, work with in the future. So that's that project for us. Um, so over to our next presenter, over to you. Thank you very much. I think we'll have questions at the end um, once we, we've heard um, and listened to all our other colleagues as well. Thank you, Vic. You can move over then to thank, our next thank presenter. You, thank you. All right. Now, thank you so much, Madam Perez. Uh, I think uh, much as we want to move over in the interest of time, but this the observations that we need to pick up from this conversation discussion is that um, you know engaging students for me sits very well because they are the future and by so by running this project in partnership with friends south africa we're really investing in the future um, and 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 congratulations to you jay for for winning a number of awards in various platforms and this says it all that the students do go through some real serious interesting engagement that make them stand out. And, uh, and what, what, what is more important as well is the element of the entrepreneurship that keeps popping up in, in this whole thing with green hope. Okay. So before we move over to the next speaker, maybe I just allow a comment or two. I would like to share this quote uh -huh, that storytelling uh -huh. brings language alive. It creates a participatory uh -huh. that allows and let us to enjoy the language. So somebody is uh, somebody is uh, disturbing us here. So yeah. I mute them. Oh no no no! It's shame 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 is Elton. Okay, let me I'll mute. <laughs> Elton, your mic is muted. Okay, now I've now I've, I've muted him. I've muted him already. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, we would like to close it out of the here as well, so that so that you don't lose your trail your trail of thought. Um, any comment on the presentation that was given now? Very interesting presentation. Um, don't take it light. It, 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 is, it is something that is important for us, especially to shape the future of our young people. Okay. Any takers? Question, comment, compliment? All right. Okay, um, Pumeza. Um, thank you. Thank you, Rita. Thank you to the presenter. I, yeah, I just raised my hand because as Brenda say, we have been part of this project and I am so grateful. I didn't know about other areas like even winning awards and how further the project has gone. And I know, I'm, I know how important it is for us as a nation, you know, seeing that even our students are able to play their part. Um, Tepi, so being here, uh, Renee, I hear you mentioned um, we were part of the research last year. We were able to do our research presentations, and this also being a research colloquium. Brenda say is busy with the um, Inter Africa Trade, so the research manager has attended the Inter Africa Trade. But uh, Tepi, so being the marketing manager, he was going to take us through, especially. With this kind of um, with this type of a project that as since has it's got a national focus, we need to have a way of 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 branding it. We need to have a way of of showcasing it now as the nation, and then how we go about those type of partnerships where some um, as the organization and then working with us. This is how you are expected. We are all expected to brand ourselves, uh, taking our products forward. It, it, it's just me making a comment. Then I will be advised by you, with Victor, as to when can Sepiso present or when can he um, have a say um, in, in terms of the. We usually do the master class, and he's going to direct us whether he do the master class or he'll just talk on the on the importance of the core branding and the nation branding. Aspect. I think given time, time constraints and the program that we've already lined up, 
we, let, let's rather arrange a special dedicated masterclass with friend SA. Because there's no way we can squeeze you in 20 minutes. We, 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 you've got so much to share with us and the nation. So mm. uh, we, we appreciate your comment. Maybe towards the end, we can get um, Tepiso to weigh in and perhaps give a, um, a, 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 an overall comment um, mm. as, as a partner in this regard. Okay. What's your take, okay. Prof. Bianca? Um, I agree. Unfortunately, we um, have two speakers still, or fortunately, we have two speakers still that um, was uh, included in the program that we need to honor. So <clears throat> let's do uh, a final, um, uh, if there's time over or left at the end to um, afford to be so. So let's right. move over to the next two speakers. Okay. Thank, thank you so much. Now we we we're stepping in into something very interesting, and I see we've got we've got practitioners. Some of us are our own bosses in our own spaces, running our own organizations, and we know how COVID has wreaked havoc and how COVID has changed the world of work, and we know how many other situations or circumstances has um, had an impact on what we do, and that leads to somewhat denting our image, our reputation. Now we have a very special colleague, um, Madame Rachine Leroux, a managing director of Reputation Matters, who's gonna share with us um, some findings on the internal climate challenges that companies face in the wake of the new world of work. The new world of work, work has changed completely. We are working, um, in, in Isuzu we say, the clock is ticking, it ticking to the hamba. Uh, but I'm, I'm sitting at home and somebody is sitting somewhere um, on the road, but, you know, uh, we're getting paid for what we do, but how does that change um, the, 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 the climate? Madam Rahim, over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Victor, and thank you, everyone. And just a massive congratulations to Prisa for the fourth year of running this colloquium. I think it's just, you know, being in the in the practice side of seeing how you bridge academia with the business world, it's, it's I mean it's a fight we've been having for years of just getting a seat around the boardroom table, um, of being able to speak in numbers. And I think you know the more we have these conversations, people seeing the importance of research, starting at um, at, at the association level, it really is just really really fantastic. So well done. To, to for for this, so I have a um, a very brief um, presentation, nothing too detailed. I don't actually need, I can happily I actually do want to share it. So I don't know if I've got sharing rights, but I think it's it's slightly different, obviously, to the to the, to the previous discussion. But when I was speaking to Victor about the topic of what I wanted to present at Reputation Matters, we do quite a few internal climate surveys. Um, because that's also where your reputation starts. Your employees are your brand ambassadors. They make or break your reputation. It's, are you either consistently good, consistently inconsistent, but either way you're building a reputation for yourself. So we actually developed a very comprehensive climate survey that looks at your, um, so Victor, I don't know if I can, let me quickly see if I can share my screen, thank you. Um, yes, you do have the rights. I do, thank you so much, appreciate that. So let me just quickly go into, into this. Um, and looking at the internal climate side of things. So I, initially I really wanted to have a look at all the big projects that we've done in 20, end of 2019, 2020 and see what the correlations were. So I can't unfortunately share too much data on that side of things because each of the subjects or each of the questionnaires we customize for each of the clients. But I think the findings that we found um, is just so absolutely crucial for any organization, whether you have one employee, a thousand employees, 10,000 employees, um, we do need to just consider the climate and do these checks with our employees. And not just, I think very often um, in the business world, we have gut feelings, we have these intuitions, but it's so important to actually put numbers to it to be able to present. So I wanted to just quickly take you through very briefly when we do a climate study or when you consider doing a climate study, it's often 
quite um, gets quite tricky or blurry with all the different versions because some people speak about employee engagement, some people want employee culture, then there's employee climate, what, what is what? So what is the difference? So just very briefly, um, how we have unpacked this and how, what we, how we look at it when we do do these measurements. Um, employee engagement measures how motivated and engaged employees are to perform their best work. So it looks at how self-driven they are, how, get, how, how related they are to the work that they do on a daily basis. In employee culture, the key word here are relationships, but very importantly, the value side of things. And that's also where I actually believe your culture starts, your climate starts, is, has everything to do with your values. Personal values, is it aligned to your business's values? And then we actually looked at combining the engagement and the culture and putting it into a climate where we have a look at your how motivated people are. You look at the values, but even more than that, we look at the reputation element of the communication side, the perception side, teamwork, employee dynamics, career development, um, so that these, these terms can be used interchangeably. But for the purposes of when we do measurements, we look at the employee climate, looking at absolutely everything, because we don't want to miss out on any of these areas. So, um, and it also provides a much richer um, element of when we do get the results. So very briefly as well, when we do look at the climate side of things, I'll happily make this available. I don't want to spend too much time on it. I want to actually get to the, to the end results, don't we always? We never ne necessarily want to go through the whole methodology side of things. We want to know what were the results and what were the outcomes. But I think it is important just to take a quick step through um, the different elements of when we look at our internal um, view. Because I think often, sometimes, or quite often, we see that the internal communication side gets handled by the human resources side, which is absolutely fine to a certain degree, but I, I, ideally it needs to stand on its own. And we do need to look at all the different elements when it comes to the, the reputation and how do we foster our employees? How do we measure that climate? So we look at the leadership side of things. So we need to have a look at the governance, how things are done, done around you. As I mentioned earlier, a reputation is built on consistency. And that's through policies, procedures. If you're consistently inconsistent, you're going to have a reputation, not necessarily the one that you want. Um, and the adaptability to innovation. We then look at talent management, so employee development and role clarity. So am I in the position that I have been appointed to, that I've studied towards, that I have experience in? We look at the corporate social responsibility element of it. Um, we look at how the business conducts it from a CSR point of view, but also involving the employees. And I'll touch on that in a second as well. Um, employee relations, so workplace dynamics, as well as diversity. And also then we look at the compensation, the remuneration and benefits. I think very often there is still the stigma or the, the not stigma, the perception that every that employees are only driven by by um, the financial and the well-being side of things. It, it does play a role. Um, obviously, it does not play a role, um, but there's often very other, many other aspects. And then we look at the communication side of things. So we look at the communication, which, which links to the morale. So those are the key elements that we look at. So when we did the, the research, when I look at the eight largest corporate surveys that we've done since, end, as I said, end of 2019, 2020, um, there were some similarities, but I, not enough for me to be able to, to put it into some sort of a, a percentage, unfortunately, because um, each, each one focused on different elements in different areas. So just, just to put a caveat in there, I like to compare like to like. Um, and often if we don't have five things, that, that uh, five answers for, for at least for each area, we, we can't take it into consideration. But I think the overall inputs or things that we we could derive from it you'll find quite valuable as well and perhaps maybe it just makes you think of something to consider for your businesses that you run as well it certainly made me think of things so very what was very very interesting across the board the reputation scores and climate scores and particularly communication scores internal communication went up 
Um, and I think it was also, there was a sense that people are a lot more mindful of realizing, sure, but we, we're working remotely, we in a totally different mindset. So we do need to take on a lot more communication. So that really improved across the board. But I think what's even more important is to keep that momentum going. So I think people realized and had to very, very quickly get into crisis comms mode. Um, Prof. Benek, as you mentioned, it isn't just a recipe of just, just focusing on that. But I think it's also looking at realizing, sure, but we definitely need to, to start communicating more and realizing. I think it's, it's been a brilliant opportunity to, to profile communicators and the role that we play through all of this. Um, what was particularly interesting for me, something that I picked up, if we looked at, um, we mentioned morale, but also movement. There's been an incredibly big movement, specifically with our Generation X employees to different companies. And if I philosophize about it, and if I think about it, um, they were also, interestingly enough, the, the generation least happy with remuneration, with well-being, with how they're being looked after. And when I thought about this, and this is my own philosophy with this, is we had we we, we were confined to our, <laughs> our our homes, and I think it made a lot of people kind of take stock. The generation X's are now, you know mid 40s going into 50s we've been in the workforce for quite some time we've put in a lot of hours and taking stock where am i am i doing what i really want to do am i passionate about what i'm doing am i being remunerated is my value being seen where we don't really we didn't really see that with the millennials not so much with the baby boomers either but specifically with Generation X. And I think once lockdown started, <laughs> I just get the sense that CVs were all over the place, looking for new opportunities, new businesses, new things. Just let's make the absolute most out of um, the time that we have. There's so much more to than just work. How do I have a greater balance? I think millennials do that particularly well to have that balance. Generation X, particularly, you, and, and I'd love to get some thoughts and feedback if you, if you agree with me on that. I think a big, big, big thing that we need to take into consideration from an internal point of view is the fact is more now, more than ever, people have had to deal with loss, grief, anxiety. There's always been some, you know, we, we are faced with death. Um, often but I don't think we've ever had to face loss to the degree that we've had to deal with it in the past two years and I think that's something that we and companies need to be even more sensitive towards of giving that grief counseling giving that space giving that support of how do you deal with this it's not just family members it's colleagues it's bosses it's 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 just touch so many people that we really need to just be even more mindful of how do we deal with that. The other thing that I was also wondering is, do we all have continuity plans in place, especially if you lose a manager all of a sudden or a boss or a leader? What is that contingency in place? And I think that's something to consider as well. Um, so getting the feedback from internal stakeholders is more important than ever. Um, we know it's important, but I think as well, what we've, uh, what we've seen, not even before pandemic times, was just that need for employees to have that sense of feedback, having that ear to listen to them. And I think now more than ever, people have that desire to actually want the feed, to, to have a channel to give feedback. Um, a big, 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 big lesson or crux of all of it on the importance of values. And values contribute to your climate. It contributes to how the things that you, your behavior, your attitude, who you do work with, your decisions that you make. And I think a key question to ask in the, any surveys that you run now or to think of, if, if there's only one survey that you consider doing for, for internal, is to confirm the values. Um, what are the perceived values that you as an organization have? 
and what are the values that are important for the employees Be and to, to absolutely cement that the, the, the values need to be in the DNA of absolutely all the employees it, it mustn't just be something that is dreamt dreamt up once a month once a year beautiful posters but it has to be entrenched and then using that very very importantly in all of the communication as well and when you do do that I want to say like a gap analysis of what your value, what you think your values are, what your employees think your values are, um, to see how do you address that. What can you do to make sure that the values are top of mind? So, for example, as a, as a side note, at Reputation Matters, part of our weekly Monday morning meeting that we have on our agenda are values, and we, the team shares what resonated, what didn't resonate with our values in the last week, because it's something that needs to be top of mind and it helps with decision-making. And that will also help with in creating inspiring communication messages. I think that's a key thing that we also, as communicators, need to do now is how do we have inspiring communication internally, externally, but for the purposes of this specifically internally, we need to, to really look after our employees. We need to rebuild trust and a sense of purpose. Um, again, as I said, I think a lot of people philosophize during the session, during the, the lockdown, um, and to show the employees that you have their best interest at, at hand. Um, it's important that the leadership comes from the lead, uh, the communication comes from leadership. There were studies done showing that the leaders during this time particularly um, are seen as the most trustworthy source of information, interestingly enough. So it is also just building that. I think because work has been such a stable constant for many, there's so many other anxiety things that have had. Having that consistency from a work point of view, the messages from leadership is so absolutely crucial. Um, it's, it, it's important to look at the health, the climate of the organization, how we're going to get the organization productive again, and then talent retention. As I mentioned, Generation X's have been all over the place. Um, but again, I think what's so important is to ask and get the feedback from the employees themselves as well. What advice do they have? They working on specific issues on a daily basis and very often they have incredible ideas um, and it's so important to, to listen to what they have to say um, it's important to be sensitive to the employee needs so part of asking something to consider if you do have a, a survey psychological readiness where are they where, from a psychological point of view of coming back to work having been in lockdown what are, what, what are the expectations where are they now I mean we've we've been starting to function considerably normal on a more normal basis although it's I don't think it's ever going to be uh, normal again it's the the the, the new way of, of doing things and what practical concerns do they have some people might be very worried about um about the workspace and, and it's, it's understanding what their specific needs are. And then also perhaps looking at ways as a team to how do we honor the past? How do we perhaps honor somebody? It can't be something that's just glazed over. We need to realize that there's, you know, people have been impacted by this. So what can we do? And this will also help to enhance the, the um, how, how the teams are, are, are connected and glued together. And then finally, to also assess and have a look at employee health, such as burnout. Um, there's a lot of anxiety at the moment um, in the workspaces, job satisfaction, and then, uh, as I've mentioned, psychological safety. But it's all good and well to do the research, but I think what's absolutely key is to translate this into a very comprehensive internal communication strategy and actually implement it to show your employees that you're actually listening to what they have to say and you base it on facts and then you can measure it year on year as well. So it's not just your intuition, but it is based on facts. So we'd love to hear any comments or um, yeah, feedback and questions if you, if you have any.
Wow, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rahim. So much has been shared. And um, the fact that we're also talking about stuff and uh, strategies and plans, this is a huge challenge. As I said earlier on, we've got employers here, we've got agencies, we've got senior practitioners. And this is something that really needs a much more, much more engagement and unpacking. And uh, you've touched on something very important mm -hmm. on the reputation because the moment you start mm -hmm. losing the staff and their commitment and, and their focus, then they are unable to do their jobs and that can compromise the image of the organization. And then there goes their reputation. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, 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 yes, ma'am. Yes, I would like to make, if I could then, uh, Chief. Um, yes, thank you very much for to Rahim for giving us that presentation. I was particularly keen on the focus that you're giving to Generation um, X and then Generation Y and Z, and wondering whether it would be useful to correlate that with this new generation coming out now, Generation Alpha, and actually the term coming out as Afro Alpha Blast because. Our generation alpha's demographics are very different to the rest of the world and actually then becomes by 2050 the dominant world force, if you want to say of workforce. Um, and so one has to look at this generation very carefully from the beginning. We're seeing a lot of um, hyper stimulation coming out in this group, their level of interactivity, the way they're engaging. I also want to just say then that this new of this launch metaverse shaping out their new reality. So I think great that we've got the past groups, the cohorts of Gen X, Y, and Z, but as this new group is coming out, let's put a stake in the sand and actually start to catch. Are you with me? As it's coming out, let's build out our own research case for Africa's um, Gen Alpha. So that's really a continuity of your work, Rahim, that I'm really wanting to motivate there. Yes, thank you. And well, thanks for that. Just a quick one. I know there's two other questions, but I just wanted to add to that. I think often we have to take a look back to take a look forward. Um, and I think what we also see is, um, I don't know whether you agree with me, but what I've picked up that our, gener our, our generation wise, ach ja, mm -hmm. ach, these, mm -hmm. sorry, these mm -hmm. and millennials mm -hmm. actually have quite a, a, a few similar traits to baby boomers. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's look at, in terms of the face to face, in terms of picking up a phone instead of just an email, mm -hmm. I mean, very, very, very generally speaking. So it would mm -hmm. be interesting to see how those, how the older generations do get picked mm -hmm. up again in the very, very newer ones. So that's Absolutely. just the, uh, Yes. Absolutely. Thank you so much again. Hey, really appreciate it. Right. We, can we take another comment? Um, question? Um, um, Renee, I saw your hand was up, but I see it's down now, so I'm not sure whether your question was answered. <laughs> uh, no, unfortunately not, but I'll take that offline with you because um, there's interesting stuff on the gap analysis. But uh, in, in the light of time and so forth, and I see there are other questions, we'll take it off, offline. Perfect. Super. All right. Okay. Um, okay. okay. No, we're doing, we're, doing, we're, we're doing well. Thanks, thanks Rahin, for this um, presentation. Um, we're really doing well for time. Now we, we, we're crossing the border from, okay. Oh, okay. Madam President. Uh, sorry, Siri's got a hand up. Um, there's oh. two more hands that I can see, Siri and yeah. Oh, thank, thank you for helping. Siri, yeah. first. Um, thank you, Rahin, for a very interesting presentation. My question is um, on the training. What do you think um, should be done in terms of training, especially the, diff the, the generational differences? Um, I heard you talk about um, the fact that Generation X are moving quickly, they are adapting to the workplace quite quickly. Um, what do you think? Do you think there, there's more that needs to be done? Do they need to pull in the other different generations? I think someone else also touched on that. Um, what do you think? Thank you. I think it does depend from organization to organization to be quite honest and I think part of when you do a survey with with your employees 
is to ask them what they what their training needs are. Um, I think very often we assume too many things. We see so many assumptions happening in organizations, assuming that that you know uh, people need specific training in something when it's when it's not that relevant to them. So I, I always say ask the ask um, the employees. But I, yeah, so I think um, that's that's just my thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mara Maholo, quick one, straight to the question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the whole beautiful presentation. Again, question. Uh, Mr. Zabebo always says the quick one. I speak very fast, but I'm always to the point. I never speak so long. <laughs> what, what you have said, Jim, is fantastic. What you have seen, and, and Prof. Benegay, thank you so much for this colloquium, because it shows the need for research and organization. And when, when Prof. Benegay was speaking, she said, um, we need a transformational mindset. And your work is showing and resonating with what, what Prof. Benneke was just saying. One has to go through all the offices in South Africa to see why research is actually required in organizations. The long queues in the post offices, the bed services inside all the all kinds of offices around. So therefore I can say organizational research has been taken for granted for way too long. And when you say when, when one person was asking the question of training, and I'm like, what is it that HR do train that aligns itself to the market demand? So it shows clearly that there is a need right now more than ever before between the Beko and all other stakeholders that we must begin to train and do research on organizations because it is a dire need. Customer service is now in the Republic. Thank you so much for this piece of work. Thank you. Wow. Thanks, thanks, Madam, Madam, Madam. Okay, um, Rahim, the last word before I take over. No, please do take over, Victor. Thank you. Um, I, right. I think okay. uh, just yeah, appreciate the opportunity. If you, I have my details. If anybody would like to to reach, us. please um, please put your your details, email address on 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 the, on the chat so that we can all click, click on that one. Right now, for the for the for the last speaker. Um, it says sometimes you leave the best for last. Now, Ms. Tuelo uh, from Botswana, you know, um, the, 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 the last speaker spoke so much mentioning assumption, 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 we assume, we assume, we assume. And we assume that because digital world and the technology has come in, everything works well. Now your paper is on digital marketing and on promotion of Botswana Human Resource Development Council. Now that, that, is, that, is, that is technology. Let's see what you've got to share with us and what were your learnings from your research in this regard. Um, over to you, Ms. Madame Tuelo, all the way from Botswana. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I don't know if you're able to see my presentation. You can see it. Thank you so much. Beautiful slide. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prez. Okay, uh, my name is Faith uh, Rapilin Duelo. I'm the manager of stakeholder relations. I have been, I'm a last year, <laughs> I mean, sorry, final uh, uh, PhD student at the International University of Management, and um, I'll be defending next week. So wow. this is the research that I, I, I carried on, you know, for the past uh, four years. So the topic is uh, effectiveness of uh, digital marketing on the promotion of uh, Botswana Human Resource Development Council's uh, services, not product services. So uh, let me go to the next slide. Okay, next slide. Um, you will recall that uh, when we speak about or we talk about digital marketing, there are many, you know, platforms under digital marketing. But for the purposes of this uh, research, I've decided, I've decided to choose uh, Facebook and Twitter. So, but we've got others that we have started um, utilizing at HRDC, being LinkedIn, um, Instagram, and then uh, YouTube, but uh, as part of the social uh, media. Uh, going to the next slide. Okay, the introduction. Um, it's a, uh, an academic round, uh, a research paper. Obviously, I have to support that with uh, what, at, what other authors have been saying on the topic. It goes with us uh, uh, to, the, to say that inevitably the, goal, the world has gone digital globally due to everyday technological advancement that continue to enhance the way we do business. This is confirmed by our hook 
Higher Standard were conduct, con, uh, conducted in 2020, where they uh, confirmed that um, ICT as an enabler has radically changed the manner in which business owners and their customers interact. You know, uh, this is um, owing to the uh, uh, digital marketing, you know, advancements that I've just um, illuminated on. And then we also see Johnson 2021, who contains that more than 4.66 billion people are currently active um, internet users being 59% of the global population with mobile internet users accounting to 91%. And then Ganga, who's a, a, a scholar from Kenya as well, you know, within the mother uh, continent, um, she argues that the growth of um, um, international technology has an enormous potential as it has tend to reduce the cost of delivering products and services to remote areas and that the technology easily brings together buyers and sellers. And Tabrizi also in 2019 also argues that businesses throughout the world have started to use um, digital marketing uh, to ensure that they remain competitive. I'll try to be as fast as I can. Um, as I've indicated, you know, Botswana HRDC, you know, has also started um, investing in, in its ICT systems to improve our service delivery. Uh, this, we did this in order to remain digitally compliant uh, because we knew that we had started using uh, social media, as I indicated, Facebook and Twitter, and of course the website to promote uh, our services. Just like any other organizations around the globe, we also took advantage of this, you know, and then we are also riding, you know, in the, in the opportunity. And uh, this has been going in for, for the past seven um, years. Uh, you would note that our stakeholders are, are all over the country and uh, some of them are also found in far-flying areas. So now the background to the research problem. HRDC as a government-owned um, organization, obviously we depend on the government subvention. And uh, as uh, um, reported in the annual report of 2017-18, um, the government has been funding um, HRDC to a tune of 49 million. And this has not been enough. So um, if you continue to operate like this, because in the past four years, we have never received any you know, budget subvention you know, owing to other challenges that the countries also are facing. So as a solution, departments in 2015 were um, urged to go and look for other interventions that could um, assist them, you know, to continue advising the mandate of the organization. Obviously, um, as, as, as at our unit, which is the marketing communications department, I've got my colleagues here in attendance as well. We had to look at uh, other, you know, um, interventions that could help us, you know, to save a lot and continue to uh, drive the mandate of um, HRDC because we were spending a lot, you know, on traditional marketing uh, platforms. So we have since um, resorted to uh, including uh, digital marketing platforms. Obviously, the statement of the problem, this was influenced by the digital marketing vanguards, such as uh, Philip Kotler, um, who says that the effectiveness of digital marketing today is going through a digital revolution uh, because you find that as consumers, you find information at the tip, at, the, at your fingertips. Say, for instance, you are looking for, for you know, for ratings about, you know, a, a, um, an organization, you can easily get that and make a decision, you know, on, on your purchasing, you know, and um, as I indicated, uh, we've been using traditional marketing and we have incorporated uh, the services and that we are able to link it with our stakeholders, you know, um, to the best of my knowledge as the researcher, little or no research on digital marketing has ever been conducted in Botswana to establish the effectiveness of digital marketing um, for, for the stakeholders. So therefore the study seeks to fill in this gap um, in our knowledge of digital marketing so that we can be better informed. So the significance of the study here indicated there's never been a study of this nature. And you will recall that at the moment, digital marketing in Botswana is used by the elite, those who are techno savvy and those that can afford you know, to buy data bundles. You know, um, to assess the effectiveness of digital marketing, there was need to conduct a scientific research in order to find the best ways of reaching out to all Botswana HRDC stakeholders, including the tertiary education providers, you know, the training consultants, employers, job seekers, lady payers, there were our ministries and also our students. You know, currently, as I indicated, is um, 
uh, digital market is currently for those that can afford, you know, for those that, you know, have not, you know, they or they might stand um, at the version of the of the margin. That's so, therefore, I wanted to investigate the effectiveness of digital marketing in order to extend um, services to all our stakeholders. In research, you know, when you conduct it, obviously you have to close the research. I mean, a gap that you've identified. As H um, HRDC, as I've indicated, is a service-oriented organization. You know, and um, I have found that when I was conducting my research. The only type of researches that were done by previous scholars were purely on product-oriented organizations, but for, for service-oriented organizations or those that um, are owned by the government or the Paris Dachels, the um, literature was changing. So there was needed um, for us to conduct the scientific you know, research to know whether digital marketing is more efficient, reliable, cost-effective, accessible you know, to all of our customers or stakeholders. Therefore, this research seeks to close that gap, and also the geographical. I mean, the geo, sorry, my time. <laughs> the geographical one uh, being Botswana um, in southern Africa. Okay, the limitations. We didn't want to go outside what the study, you know, is all about. We wanted to keep uh, uh, to what the study, you know, uh, um, in line with the objectives, obviously, and the scope. So I didn't want to go into accessing whether. Um, HRDC, we are able to do this or to measure, you know, the financial audits or compare HRDC with any other organizations, you know. Uh, so, so in this regard, we kept to what we needed to do. So the need for this um, um, digital marketing research, I'm um, having used it for the past seven um, years. There was need to assess the effectiveness of digital marketing. When you of said course. your boy has come, I thought you were talking about the big man has come from Mozambique. Okay. Oh, yeah. And then um, it is only through empirical evidence uh, that we can inform HRDs on how, why, and what needs to be done in order to curb their associated risks. Remember, I spoke about accessibility. And then also to say, um, we needed to interrogate assumptions and the hype about digital marketing. You know, this we wanted to look, you know, the hype is all about how you describe digital marketing, whether it's effectiveness, some they'll say it's innovative, it's accessible, but in the study, you wanted to look at the study factors, which are the effectiveness, efficiency, accessibility, uh, reliability, you know, preference, you know, uh, return on investments, and the digital marketing, you know, costs. So now we are here at the research objectives. This was a quite a huge uh, study, but uh, for the purposes of this um, session of this research colloquium, I had to narrow them, you know, to just to being effectiveness, the, the first and the second um, objective. The rest uh, keep on presenting as we call in the next um, uh, research colloquium. So uh, for this one, I wanted to concentrate on investigating the effectiveness of digital marketing in promoting Botswana HRDC services to our valued uh, stakeholders, customers, and clients, and then to also examine the efficiency of digital marketing as compared to other forms of marketing, and also obviously provide recommendations. And with uh, when one has to conduct on this, you know, academic research, obviously you have to go through a uh, literature review. Uh, we review. I reviewed the literature on digital marketing, you know. And I linked that particularly to the conceptual, theoretical, and conceptual and theoretical frameworks because they are the ones that you know informed uh, uh, the study. I reviewed empirical studies conducted by some researchers in the field, and also the landmark studies that inspired uh, this study. Obviously, the models you know were there, you know. And then I also looked at the studies that have been conducted. You know, remember I said on the effectiveness and efficiency and reliability, you know, in accordance with the seven objectives of this, I mean, six objectives of the study. And then in reviewing this literature, I tried to identify the gaps that uh, still exist in our understanding of digital marketing. So I'll just mention quite just a few, you know, the vanguards in the um, area of digital marketing. Um, earlier on, I spoke about um, Kotla, you know, uh, who is an expert in digital marketing who maintains that marketing today is going through a, a, a digital revolution. And then um, there's a new book, I think um, the majority of you have also seen that, is called Marketing 4.0, uh, moving from traditional to digital, you know. This book was very interesting and uh, 
I used it a lot, you know, because in this one, Kotla and others say that digital marketing is not meant to replace traditional marketing. Instead, the two should coexist in interchanging roles across the customer's path. Uh, is, this is so that you can provide for those that are techno savvy and those that cannot afford and rely only on traditional you know, marketing uh, uh, platforms. So uh, the digital marketing um, conceptual framework that we dissolved was uh, this one. It was uh, um, borrowed from Oxford um, University and um, it uh, followed the RASE, RASE model, which stands for the reach, you know, reaching out to our stakeholders and then the act, you know, the convert and then the engage. You know, if I'm to thrash out what the model, you know, the framework means, I will take the whole day, but I just wanted to show you that um, this is what informed us. And then also the stakeholder mapping, as I indicated, we've got lots of stakeholders at HRBC. We've got more than 14,000. Um, the day before yesterday, we were sitting down and um, trying to see, because we've got the latest um, a type of crop of stakeholders and um, assistance, we've got more than 50,000 um, at, at HRBC. So as I indicated, these are the learners, the employers, the levy training, levy payers, the employers, the government, you know, certain ministries after the government, and then obviously Botswana Qualifications Authority as our sister organization and Botswana Examinations Council, the civil society and, um, and all. Now, coming to the most interesting part on how I did uh, this research, is it the methodology? Um, there were questions that I had and they were answered through the use of mixed method, you know, being qualitative and quantitative. Uh, with the quant uh, qualitative and quantitative, I had um, a questionnaire which had open-ended questions. And then um, for, and then also I have semi-structured uh, interviews. This way informing the qualitative aspect of things to, as well as the focus group dis uh, discussions that we carried around the country. The reasons for using this um, data collection, you know, methods and tools were so that because this research was done during the COVID-19, I just had us, we were also talking about, you know, the COVID-19, you know, um, rude awakening that we had to do things differently. And actually it worked because we also had to do this uh, during our, our research because it was done during the lockdowns. And then obviously we had to go for interviews so that we can inform, you know, because being the latest phenomenon, digital marketing, we had to use both so that we don't leave no stones and tend. Um, so the, therefore the mixed methods were not collection of different views um, from stakeholders and it also warrants uh, good results. So the quantitative uh, data was analyzed using the SPSS uh, um, in 20, I mean, th 26, and we used uh, quite a lot in the study, you know, descriptive uh, uh, frequencies and percentages for, for quantitative data and uh, also inferential statistics, you know, and then for structured interviews and uh, focus group discussions, you know, which probably were also observations. We also uh, took advantage of this. And uh, when we analyzed them, we categorized them into study themes. You know, there's also the peer, Pearson correlation coefficients because we, have got, we had many variables that we are studying. And then also the Cronbash um, alpha was also used to calculate. As I indicated, you know, when we did the study, we had more than 14,000 and uh, we used purposive sampling because we knew exactly uh, the type of stakeholders uh, that we wanted to, 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 to draw information from, you know, or interview. And having chosen the purpose of sample, we knew that each and every stakeholder was going to be represented. And the study population was obviously Botswana HRPC staff, uh, teacher education providers, the learners, the training levy payers, the government departments, parastatals, media, you know, and others. And so this uh, came to a group of uh, six. And uh, I, I selected 420 um, uh, populations or respondents, and then uh, 72 from each uh, a group of the stakeholders that I just mentioned uh, were, were, were picked and then 348 responded, giving us an, a response rate of 82.8%. Obviously, when you go through this, you have to go dem through demographic you know, results and uh, they indicated that females between 26 and 41 statistically um, has also been supported you know, by statistics Botswana to say that there's more female population in Botswana. And then also, 
to uh, as echoed by this study findings um, that they are also available in the digital uh, marketing spaces. And then also when we looked at the preference, uh, we, we saw that 50.6% 50, preferred using Facebook, and then YouTube and those that stated um, that uh, they used uh, uh, both stood at 7.8% and 5.7% um, indicated they preferred using Facebook and Twitter and so on. And um, when you look at this, you know, the majority preferred using digital marketing platform. This is an um, of the fact that the world has got digital and so are the stakeholders who have since migrated from our traditional marketing platforms to our digital marketing uh, platforms. And then preference, as I indicated, was on both methods. Um, this one was also influenced by the technical availability because Botswana is a vast country. You'll find that in other far-flying areas, you know, of Botswana, such as uh, Seronga or out, out there, you know, up Botswana, you know, technology there is, it seems to be a problem, but the, country, the government is doing a lot, you know, to close this gap. And now coming to the core of uh, what you, we are trying to uh, share with you here, results and findings, you know, obviously the quantitative aspect, remember, is a mixed method of uh, um, research, effectiveness of digital marketing, and they indicated that it is effective because it can reach larger audiences and it is um, interactive because you get instant uh, feedback from Facebook or from Twitter. And then they prefer to use both. And then that, um, oh, sorry. And that um, in rural areas, I'm not able to see because um, anyway, let me just talk because it's something that I know. Um, they is representative because in rural areas, they prefer using traditional marketing platforms as opposed to uh, uh, digital marketing platforms because of what is available and also issues of internet uh, co uh, connectivity and that the majority of them, you know, they, uh, they prefer to use this because uh, they are available and also the private companies in Botswana can afford to invest in the systems. And now coming to the results under inefficiency, they unanimously agreed and strongly agreed that uh, HRDC uh, digital marketing plans are efficient as they have promoted its brand and that it is visible and that it is attractive and that it is competitive and uh, that it is interactive. You know, the content that we share as HRDC is, is you know, is inter interactive because we are able to get instant feedback from our stakeholders. And that there was a significant num number of those who disagreed. Remember I said, um, we've got different types of stakeholders. It's not always those that are going to agree uh, with what we wanted to, to find out because interactivity or attributiveness was also an issue. Those, some of them, they indicated that this platform, mm -mm, they're not um, 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 attractive. So there was, you know, this was some of the things that, you know, formed uh, some of the, the recommendations. Obviously, we had to also source um, quantitative, you know, respondent, I mean, qualitative respondent uh, views. I will not read through uh, this, but um, um, we had some views, for instance, you know, one of the respondents said it is effective for us, you know, just um, now I have been chatting with someone in Sepo Pasifofa, it's a far flying area in the uh, northeast area of Botswana. And she was asking me about the reinstatement process, um, about, you know, this was about learners, and I was able to talk to her. Um, and this really proves that digital marketing platforms are effective. Sometimes there are delays in procurement of the daily news, you know, um, in those areas, you know, but through the use of digital marketing, they are able to, you know, be able to uh, uh, access daily news, you know, through digital means. So let me not attach on others because we'll spend you know, lots of time and time is of essence. So looking at the results from the qualitative, you know, obviously, they also share their insights here, you know, on, on how they view HRDC platforms as being efficient. One of them said uh, the efficiency of digital marketing depends on the type of organization using it and the type of products and services that are being marketed. In my previous employment, our clients would ask if they really need a website and a Facebook page. So that's why I say it depends on the type of organization. Either way, I still think it is effective. You know, these are some of the feed or feedback that we got. Now the summary of findings, you know, um, obviously, as I have just indicated uh, or echoed their sentiments, you know, they also agree that it is effective and it is also, you know, efficient, you know, um, 
and also that they had to just help them you know, to build relationship you know at HRDC with stakeholders and that it is also fast as we are able to get you know information you know and also cheap to use as compared to traditional marketing platforms where we spend lots of money uh, when we have to advertise or do the radio or television you know we should have a budget but with the digital marketing platforms you know, the information gets, you know, out there, you know. And then as, um, so that we need to adopt digital marketing platforms, you know, as a tool to market our services. Implications, I will not uh, go much into this because um, obviously let me, in summarizing them, you know, um, when you are using the, the digital marketing platforms, they also, also the cyber crime, uh, cyber crime side of things where the, the perpetrators, you know, normally take advantage of these platforms. And normally it also affects the reputation of the organization at the end of the day. So we really need to also find ways of strengthening our IT systems and ensure that um, we are compliant recommendations, you know. Um, in order to leverage on the use of digital marketing platforms, as it's cost effective, agile, sophisticated, and has the ability to sell products to wider audiences. Digital marketing also is essential for, for business and, and that it has uh, revolutionized our way of marketing, you know, our services. And then that it is efficient, of course. Let me go to the next um, slide. Suggestions for future research, obviously, um, it was articulated that there's need to strengthen information technology security to make digital marketing platforms secure and safe for users. You know, a better understanding of an extent of IT security issues and strategic um, interventions can be explored through further research. And then also there is an issue of principle of inclusivity that ensures that all stakeholders, customers and clients uh, amongst them the elderly, because amongst our stakeholders were the long, long life learning, you know, and they must also be catered for. Remember in our society, we've got those that are visually and physically impaired. Um, uh, we, need to, we need to find ways of catering for them, you know. We know that at, uh, currently um, the, the, the digital marketing are those that um, are able to, to use them, but we need to, to cater for those that are on the other side of, other side of things because of their conditions. And that the content of HRDC digital marketing platform should be designed based on each generation unique expectations. So this was a, a recommendation to say that perhaps in the future um, one should also conduct a, you know research on this one, you know because we've got a couple of researchers at our organization, and then also there must be research to develop um, digital marketing communication strategy in view of the improving and supporting the ongoing use of digital marketing to promote our services. And further research is crucial for formulating effective capacity building initiatives for our, our staff members. And um, the conclusions. Investigate, um, since this one, the study investigated effectiveness and efficiency of digital marketing on the promotion of uh, Botswana HRDC services. Uh, we have collected insights from respondents on issues relating to digital marketing. You know, and we've also benefited from, you know, um, significant and timely contributions to the domain of digital marketing by identifying challenges and opportunities. You know, that is the pros and cons of using digital marketing. And then that the study also provided new useful perspectives, you know, structures, and, and we presented a number of suggestions uh, that I've just, you know, shared um, in the previous slide. And that, that we needed to emphasize the, the importance of strengthening IT and then also cover issues of inclusivity, and then also highlight the need to keep abreast with, with the kind of digital technology that appeals to wider age uh, group. And uh, this one that touches on, on the issue of content that uh, we have to develop. And um, the overall I mean, um, conclusion, this one, let me not go too much into it because it would take our time, but the study was, you know, um, there to invest, I mean, the main goal of the study was to investigate the effectiveness of digital marketing used by Bozona HRDC. It was to gather insights from stakeholders and then also we wanted to get their stakeholders in a voice and we did that and uh, future research uh, that I can now summarize on looking at what, you know, I, I, I've just shared with you was uh, to say that looking at the gaps that I've identified uh, in the research, 
uh, we should there should be any uh, a research on the effectiveness of data marketing for the promotion of service oriented organizations those that are owned by the government or even you know those that provide a service oriented organ because the research you know um the literature review was scanty so there wasn't much you know to be offered so that is why the study you know seeks to close that gap now coming to issue of reliability of data market or using digital marketing in a world infested with cybercrime, and uh, we need to find how organizations can guard against their reputation. I know the previous um, presenter also mentioned uh, um, on issues of uh, reputation. So that is the end. Thank you very much. I'll be waiting for your questions. Wow. <clears throat> let, let, let me first start by thanking all the delegates, all the guests in this webinar for staying put and for, for listening. Yes, I've seen one or two asking to be excused, but for you that have stayed in, it, 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 is, it is a sign of respect and it's something that we appreciate so much from, 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 from our side. Madam, thank you so much for your paper. Now this calls for action. It is a stamp of approval that we shouldn't just sit as organizations and not do anything about the current status quo of where we're at in terms of technology and what we're doing. A very sound, very professionally put together research paper and feedback. We really appreciate this. Once again, this requires a special networking session where you can present this paper at a much more relaxed time and pace and engage more with members. Um, Madam President, if I may, to those of you that I'm, I may not be in too much of a hurry, it is 13.13, may I then ask, may perhaps ask that we sort of go up until half past, but those that, that are ready to jump, um, thank you so much for being here, um, it's been a great pleasure, we look forward to seeing you on a Friday 9 o'clock, we're talking about measurement, the Barcelona principles, um, demystifying um, the myth around the, the new ways of measuring. We will be sending you communicate immediately after this. We didn't want to confuse you with, the, with, with mixed communication of research colloquium and measurement. May I then perhaps starting with Prof, Prof uh, Bieneke um, say, ma'am, there we have it. A brilliant presentation by, um, by Madame Tuello. Hey, I'm, I'm very proud of you. I'm very proud Thank of you. you. So proud. That's what Thank I can you. say. Yeah. Yeah. I, I need to echo what Victor is saying, Faith. Um, I know you you used us as, as a, a sounding board, uh, oh. which was brilliant, uh, seeing that you are defending your, your uh, study next week. So congratulations. Mm -hmm. I really think you have a sound... Um, uh, study going. I would like to suggest as what um, Victor has also called for that we um, action this um, by starting off with with finding the common um, themes between the various um, presentations and specifically also what uh, Mole contributed um, in terms of the Delphi and um, the um, all, Afro Alpha Blast uh, generation that we, we we find all of these and then specifically look at that within mm -hmm. a digital marketing platform um, and your links with obviously with other young people in the um, local universities in Botswana would go, also go a long way for us to expand on our uh, storytelling project. So mm -hmm. I really hope that uh, ho hope and wish you well for next week's uh, defending um, your you. research. Mm -hmm. I think you can be very proud of yourself. You've worked very hard for the last four years. Uh, and, and it will pay off. So congratulations from us. Thank you. Anything else you need from me, Mr. Sebeko? Do you need more questions? Vic, you on mute? Yes, madam. Um, I'll, I'll write to open for, in the absence of comments, just questions. Uh, quickly, and let's run up until half past 1330. Please um, bear with us. We've already given your time and we really appreciate this. So much appreciated. And um, the first one we ran for four hours. It was great. And but then before COVID happened and we had a contract session 
and it was brilliant. So this one, we are really confined by, by, by COVID and data. They say data. Oh, data is expensive. Oh, data, yeah, too, Raman. Oh. <laughs> so we don't really don't know. What to uh, <laughs> to Chief Victor, could I? Yes, ma'am. Chief Victor, could I hop in here? It's really just um, in summation, some thoughts that I'm having. The first one I want to put on the table is what are we using at the moment as I you want to call it textbook? What is our guiding light for academics at the moment? And is there perhaps a need from what I'm hearing? For PRISA or Brand SA or somewhere, we need a compilation of essays, um, a compendium, a something that kind of takes stock of where we're at and these research papers that are coming in because they're really valuable for us to plan kind of a way forward, but we need to get everyone on the same page. And I think because we don't have a central repository, I'm finding that at the moment with, like I used to lecture the BCom students in global business and trade, right? Now we've got this Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement on the table. And I'm having to almost immediately like put together a whole new textbook because nothing like it has existed. You get my point. So the times that we're in calls for such innovation and it is about playing in the space of innovation within the knowledge economy. And so this, I think, is where you bring these to kind of, you know, you, you kind of have to think about Who's not asleep at the switch? <laughs> Who's are, are you with me? The changes that are happening. And that's what we've been called to do here, really, is then to say, how much of this is real? If I can just onto my second point was, because I know you are making notes, Ren and Victor. I sat on the most fascinating uh, series also like this on this new metaverse. Fundamental, like existential questions. Where does reality reside? How do we validate is the future? Are you with me? Like what's, um, if you want to say meaningful when apparently you have 600 million people who according to a survey has said that they, if you're living in a cage in China and the prospect of you ever being able to get a wife to have some semblance of a normalized Chinese life looks almost impossible to them without climbing into a metaverse. So they go home every day to a wife or a girlfriend and they live a different reality while laying in their cages. Um, there's a lot of really fascinating research that's coming out of um, the universities in Australia. They've mapped together with Professor Sohail Inyatola. He's leading the UN Global Foresight team. What they've done in Australia is now they put out, it's kind of like a museum of the future. So what would Australia look like through a metaverse? And I'm saying this because, you know, Brand SA is here. And if you don't begin to pilot and prototype, are you with me? So I'm bringing it to the table. Same thing next week, I'll adjudicate some students for after the university for the film and media students. They've similarly got storytelling that's moving into what we call transmedia storytelling and doing it in real showtime, so to speak. So it's really interesting because our set of scenarios that I have on the table for the UN team is what we call Afrofutopia. And it is actually a sky fi scenarios prototype um, that provides a more, what would be our pathways of hope to a utopian Africa by the 22nd century and mapping out that. So I mean, it's just, and then of course, we've got the South American team presenting the South American scenarios. So when I'm speaking about the Delphi that this goes into, I'm saying that there's also got to be the way forward from academic rigor, it's got to have teeth to stand on par as a South African set of, of a Delphi to compare with Brazil's Delphi, Asia's Delphi. Then we in on really having a grip. And if you wanna play in this innovation space, then we have to move into that kind of the four, where is the research and where's the thinking? So we've got this now on our digital competence, let's say in Botswana, but now how do we actionably use that to shape um, an agency, uh, shape a future in which the real unmet needs are, are met? That we're really speaking in terms of strategic communication, harmonizing and building consensus and especially, I think um, Regine also picked up on that was really about this call 
for more human-centered and humanitarian ways, the empathy. So I think those were just some of, of, of the, uh, the thoughts that I had. And then when Rasheen spoke also about climate change, it triggered for me the fact that we've got this, we've, I don't know if you follow me on Twitter, I've been um, lobbying a bit for the, um, around the COP26, and now we're going into COP27. So again, here, put on the research table, what does this mean in terms of the COP deal? Can we have a round table of that? And how does South Africa's industry, how do we as communicators play our role in stepping down carbon? What does that mean? Uh, for an example, so just some things that um, I thought would be useful, and then certainly um, to be able to, to, yeah, to kind of feed into bringing together or synthesizing, we've got this field of PR and strategic communications. I see a confluence with this field of foresight and innovation. And in fact, um, Professor Philip Spiss, who was the founding director of the Institute for Futures Research. Has, he wrote one of the most brilliant papers in 2010. I can send it through to you, Rene. That is around why South Africa had never unlocked its endemic innovation competence and what that would take as a mass behavioral change initiative um, so that we change our model from a tech transfer one to actually equipping our local are you with me to come up with then what is actually then the endemic needs-based solution? Profound paper was published in the World Future Society Journal. Um, and also, you know, him being a highly, that was his kind of, you want to say the end of his career, his summation of what he saw as key for people to move forward was the unlocking uh, the democratization of innovation itself. Thank you on that, but I know you'll pick it up and I'll send you the papers. Thanks again, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, that was quite a, quite a mouthful. Um, we've, got, mm -hmm. we've got seven minutes. Um, let's see if we've got any other comment or question. I would like to use the five minutes to wrap up. And in it, while, I'm, while I'm wrapping up, as uh, um, President O'Brien was speaking, Madam President Bieneke, something popped into my mind that uh, Brent SA had a presentation ready and unfortunately we couldn't slot it in. Perhaps we should consider a special session, even if we call it in perspective, looking at all the research material where we bring in uh, Madam O'Brien to be part of the panel or, or moderate the session. And um, we will yes. gladly do that. So we'd like Brenda to give us a date. Give us a date, the first week of December. Um, I know the second week of December is going to get rough. Maybe let's look after the exams. Before we wind up the year, let's just do in perspective wrap up. Brenda say mm -hmm. brings the presentation that it was meant to, to mm. give us. And let's do this. Okay. Mm. Absolutely. Right. Count me in. Great. It's wonderful. Okay. Um, Madam, Pre okay. Madam President, there are no hands. And um, perhaps, okay, we'll give you, you yeah, all right? Oh, Sorry, yes, ma'am. Just unmute. There are two hands that I can see, one from Pamesa and one from Murumukholo. Um, oh, uh, I have to toggle between screens because there's too many people here. I know, I know, that's why I'm warning thank you. Thank you, thank you for looking out for me. Thank you. All right, let's, let's, let's get it, Pamesa. Yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Budvik. Thank you, Renee. Um, yeah, I think it makes sense when you say maybe let's have a special session. Give me that theme again, Budvika. In perspective. In perspective. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad Tepiso is also here, so we would have to then go back into uh, the planning. We maybe just one hour session with you as Prisa and also even with you, Jay. I'm just wanting to understand is there, are we now talking from UJ perspective or are we talking for, to our partnership as Prisa? I know you both are my partners, you both are my stakeholders, um, but mm. the relationship is, 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 is sometimes the three of us um, when it was in the, with, with, the, with the storytelling. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and but when we come to Prisa, then we come as Brenda say, um, uh, yes, on, 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 
yeah. on the research colloquium on, on picking up all the conversations and putting them together and looking at uh, brand SA and your and, and, and what you have to offer. We will do it under the three partnership, UJ, Prisa, okay. and Brand SA. And Brand SA. Okay, no, of. that's fine. I'm happy. I'm happy yeah. with it. Anyway, I just wanted clarity. Then right. uh, Tepiswa and I then will, will liaise with you and then we get the state. And then okay. we could do, as you say, first week of December. First week of December would be a good uh, time to meet because uh, towards the end of December, no one is interested. Uh, no, no, no. All right. Okay, and that is not far. It's next the uh, next two weeks or so. Okay. Mm. All right. No, thanks. Thanks so much. Um, your special greetings. I wish I could just mention everyone who is here. Herbie, Fande, Brian, Dopo, Imo, Huti, Chris Fleming, Amos and Chabaling, Mr. Tapiso. You know, yeah, it's been great. Um, okay. Before I hand over to Madam President Shubhyanake to wrap up. Ladies and gentlemen, I will be saying immediately when we when you drop off, you will be getting the link for Friday measurement month. Um, very interesting discussions will be taking taking place, demystifying what people think is very difficult to do, looking at the new ways of measuring what we do, the impact of what we do. And uh, from me, thank you so much. Um, this has been great, and thank you for making time, Madam President. Over to you. Thank you, Vic. Um, I just see Murumaholo's hand is still up. Is it a previous hand or is it a, a new comment? Uh, as, as a legacy hand. Or is it a legacy hand? No, it's a brand new question. Legacy hand. Oh, okay. <laughs> Go for it. Thank you very much, um, Madam Tuello, the new doctor. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Now, two questions. Thank what, you. What law no regulates what, what law uh, the digital space in Botswana? What law regulates digital marketing space in Botswana? Two, what is the percentage in terms of stats of people with access to technology or your Twitter, your Facebook in Botswana? Thank you. Uh, I, think I, think I like it now, you know, and, and I know you're good. Uh, I said just get to the point. Hit it. Thank you so much for the questions. You you, you came a bit light, soft though. I hope uh, Madam um, Tuelo had you. Over to you, Madam Tuelo. Okay, thank you. Even though it was not clear, um, the, the, the audio, hey, hey, she's not clear. I don't know whether mm -hmm. she's uh, tweeting from the car. <laughs> uh, I think I've just seen an email uh, coming in, but uh, from what I gathered, the, the first question she wanted to know the, what regulates digital marketing was on. Is that so? Yes. Okay, uh, we've got Bokra. Bokra, you know, is Bozona Communications, you know, regulatory authority. You know, they are also responsible for that, and also the Ministry, you know, for uh, of communications. So those are the two arms or two uh, um, departments or two entities that um, have been uh, regulating that. Of course, you know, uh, there has not been a policy that has been developed, you know, to to regulate, you know, that, you know, because. Um, earlier on, you picked that in the study, I spoke about, you know, the cybercrime, but with the, the cybercrime, you know, act that we have, we are able to you manage that to some extent, but with the other aspects, you know, nothing has been put, you know, um, into place with regards to uh, value statutes. And then the second one, I couldn't hear it uh, clearly. Mm -hmm. What are the figures of persons who got access to digital technologies in Moderna? Oh, that one um, fell under my study delimitations. I did the, it was outside the, uh, the, the scope of the study. So I couldn't uh, even, because I was concentrating on uh, our stakeholders. But uh, from what I gathered, you know, it appears that a lot of uh, them are, are there, but this also calls for, for the next, uh, you know, research, you know, or future research. There are a couple of research, you know, researchers here from, from Botswana that are in attendance and probably they could answer that one. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Press, please wrap up. Thank you, Vic. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as um, Victor said, we it has um, just been amazing that so many of you stuck around for two and a half hours. We really appreciate
um, you know, we, we sometimes don't have a cutoff date when, or time when we are enjoying ourselves. And I was thoroughly enjoying myself because what came through for me is the, the synergy that we have and the, the real interest in um, finding nuggets um, of knowledge amongst each other that we can use as catalysts and springboards for future action. Because to me, research should never ever just stay in one hub. As much as we want to have a centralized repository for all of these wonderful things to be showcased, we must have that. And we must share this. It was also a, it should also perform a, um, energizing catalytic role into getting us into doing something with this knowledge. And that's what I'm looking forward to is to how are we going to put this into workable actions and I've made many notes. So uh, there's a lot of, of things going to come, um, uh, you know, to everybody's uh, inboxes soon of future projects and future research. So thank you so much for joining us today. And we're looking forward to having you in the future. Thank you for putting that up so quickly, Vic. And uh, we hope to see you <laughs> on, on Friday um, of demystifying, demystifying Barcelona principles and measurements. So uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you again to Victor for always just being there as the amazing support and uh, our host. Thank you, Vic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your afternoon. Everything of the best. Please, Friday, 9 o'clock, let's all meet. And this is very important. You need to master what you're doing um, in, in, in your workplace. And this is the new way of measuring the impact of what we do at all times. May the good almighty bless and keep you until we meet again. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Tell us to do this. To do this. Bye. Oh.